Hello, come on in. My name is Rick Boot. Welcome to wood carving. This is not what you think it is. I haven't whittled out this whole chair with my knife, but I am doing a little decorative carving on it. This is chip carving, or Kerbschnitzen, and it fits this style chair because this chair is an example of a centuries-old design. It was very popular around Switzerland and Germany and Austria, up in the mountain regions. It's called a Bernstuhl, or a farm chair, and it's a very simple design but yet it has a nice little flavor and elegance of its own. It's very simply made. There's a back that it's cut out and fits into the base and has four legs that fit into holes drilled in it. And that's all there is to it. It's basically made from a simple mortise and tenon joint, the mortise being the hole through the chair seat and the tenon being the peg. The back fits in the same way. We've got these tabs on the back, or the tenons, and the holes in the seat, which is the mortise. It all just fits together just like that. It's an example of a, a simple farm style, but yet, once you put these carved decorations on it, it has a beauty of its own. It becomes, well, it becomes country, rustic elegance. Now, this particular chair was made by a friend of mine, uh, Gottlieb Brandley, who sent it to me, and I've been doing the chip carving on it. And I thought it'd be interesting today to try and recreate making the style chair using the same sort of tools that these people used up in their farmhouses centuries ago. For making the back, I've been cutting around here to shave out the back of the design here. And I'm using this very old bow saw. It's a very ancient design, and it's what they used before they had band saws. You see these old farmers up there, they didn't have electricity, so they had to do everything by hand. And once you get going with this tool, it has a very simple rhythm, all of its own. Well, and so on. The secret to this particular saw is its thin blade. It's got this very thin blade that you can adjust the angle of by turning these handles here. And it's made from a couple sticks of wood and held together by some twine that's tightened to keep the tension on the blade. Once again, it's an example of sort of rustic country sophistication. And just use that to cut out the rest of this uh, top here. Now, one of the things that I did was before I cut it out, or before I glued it up together, I cut out these center parts. And that makes it a little easier than having to reach in there with a saw. You don't have to take the blade out to fit it in. So these tricky parts here, I cut out beforehand, and then I glued it together. Now when you're gluing it together, one thing you want to be careful of is to make sure you have the grain lined up just right. Now this is important when you have a large expanse of wood like this. Let me show you what I mean. When you look at the two end pieces of wood here, you notice that the annual rings, which tell the age of the tree, have a certain curve to them because of the way the tree grows around. And in this case, you see on this side of the wood where they're kind of scooping around this way. Now what happens is if the humidity changes, this board can tend to warp a little bit and change its shape. And what happens is it tends to cup a little bit. And the direction that usually goes is these lines start to straighten out. So that means this part of the board or part of the seat is going to cup towards this way. Now if you put two boards together and they cup both the same amount, then you get quite a bit of warping in it. And once you have it into the chair seat, it can tend to split. So you notice on this one, I put this board at the opposite direction. The grain lines curve around the opposite way. So that way, any changes that are going to be occurring in the wood, the warping is going to tend to cancel each other out. It's one of those tricks that these people just knew. You know, they had spent centuries discovering this by trial and error and were able to make just a, a type of technology all of their own. You can see it a little more clearly on this seat. Once again, you see the grain lines cup around this way. And on this one, I've arranged it so they cup around the other. That way, you never have to worry about this thing warping and splitting and falling apart. Now, the seat is made of pine. And this is uh, one and three quarter inch pine. And it's nice light wood, but it's easy to carve, which will be important when we get to doing some decoration on it. This is held together by some clamps. These are called pipe clamps. And I glued this up a little while ago. And these pipe clamps take a piece of uh, a bar of steel. It's got a little sliding end to it. 
And you lock that down and then tighten it on the other side here. And that draws them in place. When I'm carving up a large plank like this, I usually put two on the bottom and then one on the top because the pressure on the bottom tends to make this swell out a little. And by putting one on the top, it brings it down flat. I'd suggest using a glue like a white glue like Elmer's or Tight Bond or something for gluing that. And it works quite well. It's a water soluble glue and makes a very strong joint. Also, when you glue this up, it's not a bad idea just to glue the planks together before you cut them out. And that way you have flat surfaces to put the clamps to. Now, for drawing out the position of the legs here, I've worked from Mr. Brandley's original pattern, which I figured must be pretty good. He's been making these chairs all of his life, uh, at least 42 years. And in the Swiss area where he is from, the leg holes are pointed, positioned out here at uh, three inches in from this side and three inches in from here for the front leg. And then three and a half inches in from the edge there and five and a half inches in for the rear leg. Now these other spots will be the slots where the tenon from this, the seat back will fit in. And these are one and a half inches in from the edge of the seat and the center line is three inches down. So these are just some of the basic measurements that someone came up with and it became classics. Now when you get the glue dry on this and you're all done, you can cut it out either with a band saw or a bow saw and you'll have something that looks like this seat over here. And this is one that I've been playing around with. Plunk that down. Now the tricky part on doing these seats is going to be making the holes for the legs. You see, the legs don't sit perfectly vertical out of the bottom of the chair because you don't have any stability that way. And you need something that's going to take some of the weight and make it a little stronger. So what they would do is they'd angle these legs out a bit or splay them. In this particular case, the classic design that these old alpine farmers came up with was to take the front legs and cant them out at an angle or splay them out at an angle of 7 degrees, whereas the rear legs are splayed out at an angle of 15 degrees. And that gives the seat a little bit of a backward slope, and it makes it more comfortable. Now the tricky part is getting the angle on these legs. What I've done here is I've drawn a line, a diagonal, between the points where the chair legs are going to be going in. And that'll serve as a guide when I go drilling my hole. To get that angle, it's kind of tricky. You're going to have to eyeball it just a little bit. And one of the things that helps is to use a sliding bevel. And I've set this at 7 degrees. Seems that that's a beautiful little tool, because that's one I made in this country, believe it or not. Brass and rosewood inlay. Unbelievable. OK, I'm going to set that on the line. And then let's get this locked down good here. I find it works best if I put a seat clamp on the end. Let's get a pad of wood to put under there. That'll keep the seat clamp from digging into the seat back, or seat bottom. Now for drilling the hole, I am going to use what's called an expanding bit. And this is a type of drill bit that has a sliding piece in the inside. And you can actually set that for different diameter holes. And this one is going to be set for an inch and a quarter, which is the size of the tenon that was traditionally used. I'll set that in the hole. Now to get that angle, I'm just going to kind of line it up by eye with the angle I've got on this bevel and drill the hole. I don't want to go all the way through on this because this particular type of bit can really cause a lot of splintering on the other side. So I can see some daylight. And to trim that off, I'll just take and uh, get that with a knife later. Now to drill the back, 
or the, the mortises for the back, use exactly the same system. Put that in the bench dogs, get your bevel gauge. Now the back is set at seven degrees too. And I'm drilling these from the bottom, so I want to make sure I've got these slanting the right way. The back, I'm using a piece of one inch board. So I changed my bit to a one inch hole and drilled three of them across there. Then it's just simply a matter of getting a chisel with a straight edge and just carving away that excess wood between the holes. Now this is going to take a little while. Don't be in a big hurry on this. You're probably thinking, oh, well, there's faster ways you can do this. You could use a, a drill press or a this or a that. But like my friend Gottlieb said, these people did a lot of this work up there in the winter. And when you're up in the mountains in the wintertime and there's four feet of snow on the ground, it doesn't matter if it takes all day to make a single hole. It's good for you. I know that's true in the Adirondacks. We have something called cabin fever that people get. It usually happens about uh, February if you've had snow on the ground for three months and you realize there's going to be snow on the ground probably for another three or four months and people start thinking, oh no. Now we've got the holes drilled, we can get on to making the legs. I'll just take this out of the vise here. Now I cut a leg a little earlier, ripped it down with a saw, and the legs are fairly easy to lay out. It's made from a two inch square piece of wood that tapers down to one inch at the base. To hold this, I'm going to use the bench dogs in my vise. The bench dogs are just little metal pegs that fit in holes in the vise. And when I tighten the vise down, it clamps them into position. The only thing you have to watch out about them is make sure that it's down low enough so that you don't hit it with your tools. It'll take quite a nick off the edge of a plane or anything else. Let me clear the decks here. I like making these legs because I like the planes. I like the shavings. I think everyone has good memories about plane shavings. You know, it's one of those things that they're great to get a big pile of them and drop them on the cats or. I remember when I was a kid, I used to put them in my hair and uh, <laughs> make it look like a powdered wig. All sorts of crazy things you can do. And make quite a mess with them, too. This is beautiful wood. This piece of wood is, in the Adirondacks, they call it popple, which I always thought they were saying poplar, but it isn't. It's, uh, the wood is actually closer related to Quaking Aspen. And this particular northern variety grows very hard and is strong enough for chair legs. Now, I'm going to take and smooth down this sharp edge here. That'll dress it up a little bit. Also, when you're sitting in a chair and you uh, bump it with your foot, it's not going to hurt quite as much. Now, for cutting this sh chamfer, it's C H A M. F-E-R, chamfer. It's wider at the bottom than at the top. So the way to do that with a plane is you start at the bottom and make your strokes and then just keep gradually working back. And that'll make it wider at the bottom because you've taken off more wood at the bottom. Now it may look like I'm dragging this blade sometimes back across the plane, but actually what I'm doing is just resting it on the toe. Don't lay it flat and drag it across, because that'll dull your blade down. And that's the chamfer. You just do that to the other sides, and you have your leg pretty well done. Now, one of the things that you have to do with the legs is to cut the tenon. that will fit up through the hole in the chair leg. The best way I have found you start out, and these legs are 20 inches long, but the actual leg itself is only 17. So I start out and scribe a line 
three inches around it. Let me just check my tool here. And this mortise gauge is a beautiful little tool. Once again, an example of a simple tool that becomes a, a work of art. Its whole function is just to make a scratch on a piece of wood. And then it's got a little sharp nail point there. And I just take and I'll scribe that around. There we go. Now these lines don't have to be 100% exact because we'll be doing some finishing work on this later. Now we put it into the vise. Now how round are you going to make this? How do you know how round this has to be? Well, one of the ways of doing it is to find our center, take a ruler, and lay it across the diagonal. Make it uh, mark that way, and lay it across the diagonal the other way. And draw a line, hopefully a straight line. And then take a compass. Now, the diameter of this is going to be one and a quarter inches. So I set my compass at 5 eighths, which works out to be half of one and a quarter. And these two diagonals cross at exactly the center point of that piece of wood. I just take, draw my circle around, and I've got it. Now all we have to do is imagine this tenon inside the wood and carve away everything that isn't part of that tenon. Well, the way to start that is to get a saw. And take my dog out so I don't take on the saw. I'm just going to cut around that, carefully eyeballing it, and just cut down to about where it looks like it gets close to my mark. Looks like about as far as I better go on that. It's best to err a little on the outside of that line. Now to take and work that down, I'll use the chisel here, and this is a number five um, gouge that's 35 millimeters wide. The size doesn't matter exactly, just something to split away some of that excess wood. I'm going to start well at the outside and work my way in. Because you never know, sometimes that grain might take a twist on you, and instead of splitting straight, it might curve in. And the one thing you don't want to do is make this tenon too small. Because if it's too small, you can't, make it wide, you can't make it bigger, and you can't make your hole smaller, so then you have to scrap the leg and start over. I'll just take and work this down. Well, anyway, this is how you round it out. And just go ahead and work that around and round it down pretty close. But keep checking it. Don't take a chance on making it too small. Now for the fine tuning, I suggest using a rasp. And this is uh, just a, basically a coarse file. And you can take this and smooth down that wood until you get exactly the shape that you want. But always keep checking it against the hole. What did we do with our, our seat here? Uh, here we go. Okay, now, you can tell I've still got a ways to go on this one. But when you get it down to the right size, this is one I've been playing around with earlier. When you get this thing down to the right size, what you need to do for your finishing touch is to shape the shoulder on it. See, one of the things is this section around here should fit flush with the bottom of that chair seat. And that way, when you sit in the chair, that's going to take all the weight. It's going to be transferred right to the leg instead of binding up on that tenon. To mark that out, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Grab yourself a pair of dividers and set those for the high point 
of your uh, of your cut there, and just score a line around there. And just do that all the way around. And that'll give you your measurement exactly. Then put it back in the bench dogs again. Woof woof. This is the same kind of bench they use in Switzerland. As a matter of fact, I was uh, visiting with some carvers there once, and uh, a gentleman had loaned me one of his gouges to use. And I was roughing this thing out, and he he wasn't sure if I knew about bench dogs or you know hitting the tools or not. And uh, I had to set down low enough. I was being very careful, but he was trying to be unobtrusive. But he was watching me all the time. <laughs> And uh, just to make sure I didn't dull his nice gouge, so I cut along this scratch on the shoulder here. And bring that down about to where you want it. Then go back to your gouge and just whittle that around between the saw, and the gouge, and the knife. You can shape this down so you get a nice, perfect, exact fit. Now what you want is to have this so it fits real flush, like on this one over here. Now you notice that it fits exactly right up against the chair seat. And as I say, when you sit on this, that transfers all the weight to the chair leg. Now one of the last things you want to do on this chair leg is to take and when you have this in position, take and draw a line across your chair leg. Then take a fine saw and cut a slot down the most of the most of the length of this tenon. That's for a wedge. And that's the final thing that locks this chair leg into place. This little hardwood wedge. And you just cut that very thin and then put some glue in there and tap that home with a hammer. But the important thing is you want this line to go across your chair. You can see here how the wood grain goes along the seat. If this were set in this way and you put pressure against it, as this tenon expanded, what would happen is it would cause the chair seat to split. And after all that work, you don't want to do that. So that will lock your chair leg into place. The other thing you might want to do for added comfort is to take and hollow the seat out. And that's an optional thing. Let me just take a minute here and show you how you can do that. So just take your gouge, a number five or a number seven, and just scoop that wood away. Now, one thing that you'll find is on a soft wood like this, if you carve across the grain, you just want to carve easier than carving straight away. If you carve parallel to the grain here, especially on this piece because I've got several knots in it, that grain can get wild and you can cause a lot of splintering. And if you do your initial roughing out going across the grain, you'll find it works out much better. So just hollow that chair seat out as much as you want and do a little sanding on it, and that'll be very comfortable. The last thing you'll probably want to do is some decoration. And that's what I was doing when you came in. And I'm using chip carving on this, which uh, is very fitting because it's a Swiss style. Remember the other day I showed you the German style where you take and incise a line on each of the center parts of this triangle? Well, there's another way that you can do that. And this is how the Swiss do it. Instead of inscribing the center stop cuts, what they will do is actually just take and carve right down to the bottom of that triangle. And I'll bring this around a bit. This is a fun way to decorate it. You can see I've already gotten some started on it already. See, by doing that, you just carve it right out with one big chip. 
It takes a little more practice to get it that way, but once you get down to that ability, it really goes well. This is how they're doing it in Brienz in Switzerland, which is a small little carving village uh, up in the mountains. So there is the Swiss chair. It's great. I love it. It is so much fun to do, and you have something of lasting beauty and such a comfortable place to sit, too. It's amazingly comfortable. Well, I think that's about all we can do for today. Next week, as long as we're doing things for the house, I'd like to show you how to make some scoops. These are the scoops that you can use for sugar or flour. And if we have time, we might make some cookie molds to go along with it. So thanks for dropping by. And until next time, this is Rick Boots wishing you happy carving. How to Carve Wood, a book of projects and techniques by Rick Boots, is available by calling 1-800-950-WMHT. With more than 200 pages and over 400 photographs and illustrations, including patterns for some of the projects in the series, this companion guide presents important woodworking techniques. For your copy, call 1-800-950-WMHT. The cost is $17.95 plus handling. Please have your credit card ready when you call.